I'm here because right now I'm on the internet. OK, I'm actually equivocating a bit here, and I'm insulting my audience. So let me actually go back and describe what I'm saying here. Some of you may have noticed the cameras all around this room when you came in. What's happening right now is that all the speakers that you've seen today are being picked up by charged couple devices in those cameras and sent across the world on the internet on the TEDx Redmond site. And so this is me, by the way. And so it's really fantastic because I'm here to talk to you because of those cameras. I'm here to talk to you about the cameras. And I'm here to talk to you about how the internet and how this distribution that we're seeing today even affects our world. So that's me. Um, like they said, I am a technology enthusiast. And one of the things that I've actually done as a technology enthusiast is I've helped a lot with a nonprofit. Um, I'm actually the chief operating officer of this nonprofit, Student R&D. Uh, we're a local nonprofit, actually. And as a chief operating officer, I do some things to keep the charity operating, like you know, painting, repairing. My shoes are covered in paint today. Um, but I also have to consider how we can better, basically, how we can operate better using technology. And so I've thought a lot about this over the past few years, how we can actually use the technology of the internet and things like that to actually better run our nonprofit. And as a result, I have some information for you. So first of all, we have to think about some critical things to define how, what technology is. So I'm going to ask you, what is the internet? Well, here's a map of the internet. If you're technical enough, this means something to you. This is a very old map of the internet. Here's a, another slightly more complicated map of the internet. Some of you who are more technically inclined might recognize this map of the internet from XKCD. <laughs> I'm really happy to hear that there were that many people. Um, and then this is also another map of the internet. And anyone can recognize this. This is the map of the world and the internet. And the thing is, as someone who's fairly technically inclined myself, I can tell you, these are all perfectly valid ways of looking at the internet. But they're also all completely different ways of looking at the internet. And so how can we have four different ways of looking at the same thing? Well, it's because it's very difficult to define what a place in the internet is. And that's the fundamental concept of making maps. So is a page a place? That's a pretty easy distinction to make. Let's say a page is a place. There's a place. There's a place. And you could say maybe these are both part of the city of Amazon, or so, so to speak. Well, OK, so they're both places. But if you notice, a lot about them is very much the same. And then there's very, very slight differences as well. So you might notice that my name is at the top. So how do we define this as a place? Is it, one, is it two places with subplaces that are the same? And what about my name at the top? Does that mean that everyone has like their own borough of Amazon that's exactly the same, but with their name at the top? It's really complicated. It doesn't make any sense. The, the, really, the more you think about this, the stupider it seems to try to define the internet as a place. And that's exactly the problem. When we think of space, we think of it in two different ways. There's the sort of measured space, the idea of like, OK, I can tell you, take a, go 405 north and then go on 8th Street East and make a right on 132nd. The idea of measured space is that it's the same for everyone. No matter who you are, who you're talking to, measured space is the same for everyone. You can say something is a certain distance or a certain volume. But then measured space is actually a relatively new invention compared to, I don't know, the beginning of humanity. Because even before we had language, and even before we had tools that needed measurements, and even before we needed to tell people how to get to the Microsoft Convention Center at 1230 today for this talk, we had experience space. The idea of what something feels like when you're there. Two people can walk down the exact same path on the exact same street at the same time, side by side. And depending on how their day is going and how they feel and how they've been brought up, they can have a completely different experience. And what really makes the internet hard to define in the way that we, I was trying to do at the beginning of the talk is that the internet is a space without the former. It has no measured space. The internet is an entirely experienced space. It's unique for each of you. It has all of the experiences. And it makes sense that it's become that way. When you think about it, the earliest archives of knowledge, we had libraries. And libraries have books. And books have one place. They, they are very, very constrained to the earlier, the metric measurable space. A book is either here, or it's there, or it's somewhere else. This is why books have barcodes on them at libraries. Because if I have the book, the library doesn't have the book. And if I have the book for long enough, they're going to get upset. But the thing is, having a book that has to be in a specific place, like we have at libraries, 
has a lot of constraints. And so what we came up with was card catalogs. And you can think of books as a first order information system in the sense that they have one specific location. And card catalogs reference this location. So whereas a book has to be ordered in some way, usually the Dewey Decimal System, which has its limitations, a card catalog can be ordered on author, it can be ordered on subject, and it can be ordered on as many of those as you want. So if you want to look for a book by a subject, you could just find a card catalog that's sorted by subject. But the problem with card catalogs is that they take a lot of space and they take a lot to maintain. They're better than having multiple copies of books sorted in every way, but they're really not that much better. That said, we lived with card catalogs for quite a long time. But then fairly recently, we came up with the sort of third order information system, search engines, the internet. The idea of the internet is you put all the information you have about books online. And then people can find their books however they want. Here I, I did a search based on keyword, and I found Principia Mathematica, which is what I was looking for. But I found all sorts of other books that were related. Maybe they had a word in the description. Maybe they had a word, maybe the, the author happened to be that name. Who knows? But the thing is, with a card catalog, we would have needed several thousands of card catalogs to sort on everything, to sort on descriptions, just words that happen to be in the description. And it goes even further than that today. Google, I search for Principia Mathematica, same book, I get the information that everyone has ever said about it. I no longer have to trust the author. I have to trust what everyone else has said. They could be criticizing. Who knows? And of course, the fact that the information is, is so freely available and that the internet doesn't have a specific space leads to things like piracy, which a lot of people complain about. You know, Our generation doesn't seem to have that. And that's for a very specific reason, which I'll talk about in a second. But the thing is, more than just piracy, the idea is the internet has no measured space. And so information in general can, pro can flow very freely. And there's a lot of information out there. So the internet is a very, very level playing field for information. And that's what makes it so great for knowledge and for exchanging knowledge. And there's a lot of information. I mean, this is like several, like several hundreds of people talking at the same time. And there's like five or six conversations going on. And there's some solutions that people have come up with. There was an excellent TED talk um, about the idea of filter bubbles. And so the idea is that I could be searching for something as myself, and Google would find out, well, you know, he seems like the sort of person who's interested in traveling information. But someone who's entirely unrelated is going to get information about the protests in Egypt, which I think this is a, personally a fairly dangerous idea, of the idea of machines making our decisions for us about what we want to know. But we don't need that. The thing is, our generation, the younger generation, has gotten so used to having this technology that we can find the ideas ourselves, which make the most impact on us. Think about everyone here today, and more importantly, everyone who's watching this on the internet. And they could be anywhere in the world watching this on the internet. And they might have heard an idea today. It might even be this idea that's made a huge impact on them. And they found that out of all of the ideas online just by some chance or just some noticing. And there's so many ways of doing that. Here's a site like Quora, where people ask questions and people answer questions. And you vote up and down your favorite answers. And there's other ways of doing it. So for example, I'm teaching a class um, later this year on this site called the University of Reddit. And basically, anyone can teach a class. And you have one professor, and they're teaching a class for a long time. And then there's going even further. You have sites like Khan Academy, which actually uh, he's given a TED talk, if you have noticed that. But He's one person who teaches all of the subjects, essentially. And he's, an, he's become an expert on every subject. And there's all sorts of ways that going down from Quora, which is just everyone talks about everything, to Khan Academy, where you have one person. But they all have one sort of thread in common, community. Even on Khan Academy, this is the comments on Khan Academy. Everyone is willing to contribute so much information to the, to the discussion. And so Khan makes a video, and people are willing to discuss things and help other people. And this is the common thread of knowledge on the internet. And this is what makes the internet such a powerful place, is just everyone can contribute. It's such a level playing field for information. And so let's say I want to learn about science or technology. This is exactly what programming is like, by the way. Any of you have programmed, it's exactly what it's like. But the thing is, I can go online and find guides like Python. This is a Python wiki, if any of you are into Python. I know someone was talking about open source earlier today. Pretty cool, Python's open source. The really cool thing about this is not the fact that it's out there and that it's on the internet, but that it's if you look at who's been creating this, there are thousands of users who've been creating and maintaining this information. And everyone knows something very specific. And they all get together and create this guide. And it's not just that. You go to something like Wikipedia. Wikipedia has such a large range of information. I mean, this is a logarithmic graph. 
at the very top, that top line is 10 million articles. It's just so amazing that people are willing to contribute information to a common goal of just advancing the human population. That is what makes the internet so impactful. It's a level playing field for information. Everyone can help out. I hope that everyone here today, because you're all such impactful people, by even coming here, can just sort of put our new technology to use when you're thinking about how to change the world. Thank you.